This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Um, Joe asked me to address the issue of whether or not uh, the results of um, CAS, carotid angioplasty and stenting, did or did not improve over time. Uh, just to remind you a little bit about the uh, CREST trial design, as, as you all know, it was a prospective randomized trial of both symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. Primary endpoint, or I should say the primary endpoint, which was a composite of death, stroke, and myocardial infarction. Uh, approximately 2,500 patients uh, uh, were randomized, and we were told by our statisticians that that would give us a 90% power to detect the 1.2% absolute treatment difference between the two procedures. 1,240 patients were randomized to endarterectomy, 1,262 patients were randomized to angioplasty, total of 2,502 patients, roughly 50-50 divided between asymptomatic and symptomatic, with a follow-up of uh, 2.5 years at the time of the initial report. Now the bottom line, or top line if you will, is the, the primary endpoint of the combination of death, stroke, and MI uh, showed no uh, statistical difference between carotid endarterectomy, 4.5%, versus carotid angioplasty and standing of 5.2%. However, we have to remember that the reason we're doing any intervention is to prevent uh, death or disabling stroke in patients with carotid bifurcation disease. So if you look at the what most of us would consider to be the important endpoints, death and stroke, we now see a major difference, and that is carotid endarterectomy. We're able to do this overall with a 2.3% uh, event rate versus 4.4% for angioplasty and stenting, and that difference indeed was statistically significant. Uh, this leads, I think, in retrospect to a, an analysis error, and, and it reflects the way in which we designed the trial. And when you have a composite endpoint, that is death, stroke, and MI, what you're saying is that you're simply adding all three of these together. And when you do that, you're saying that death is the same thing as stroke, is the same thing as MI. Uh, I think somebody would much rather have a uh, uh, chemical MI than they would be dead. Yeah, but yet, all three of those are being counted as the same. Now, all, all of these endpoints are important, but they should have been weighed according to severity. And this is a scale that I would propose. It's not been used, but just something that you might want to think about. And if we look at the uh, three adverse events, uh, I would assign a, a, a point count of 10 points if somebody dies, a major stroke, eight points, a minor stroke, seven points, and a myocardial infarction, five points. Had we done that, what would have happened? Well, here's what the analysis is. If you look at the adverse events uh, based upon a point count, in death, there were nine deaths with the angioplasty and stenting. That would have given you 90 bad points. There were four deaths with carotid endarterectomy. That would have given you 40. And we'll go down the line with all of these. And the bottom line is that in terms of the adverse event point rate rates, carotid angioplasty and stenting would have had 535 bad points, carotid endarterectomy 391 bad points, and that difference was statistically significant in favor of carotid endarterectomy. 
We also learned some other things during the course of the Crest trial, and this has been replicated in other trials that have been published. And uh, contrary to what you might think, older patients did better with carotid and dardorectomy uh, than they did with angioplasty and steading. And the inflection point occurs at around age 70. So patients over the age of 70 fall into this blue zone where carotid endarterectomy is adjudicated to be su superior. On the other hand, younger patients fall into the pink zone where carotid angioplasty and stenting uh, appear to be uh, superior. The other thing, uh, and this is data that probably nobody's ever seen because it got published in uh, Lancet Neurology instead of one of the journals on this side of the Atlantic. And this is the com composite endpoint, death stroke and myocardial infarction, looking at gender and comparing angioplasty and stenting. And what you can see in this blue line are women undergoing carotid angioplasty and stenting. And they're off the map. I mean, women undergoing carotid angioplasty and stenting have an extraordinarily high adverse event rate compared with men. On the other side of that, the, these three lines that are clustered here represent women undergoing carotid endarterectomy, men undergoing carotid endarterectomy, and men undergoing angioplasty. And so when you separate out the gender issue, angioplasty and endarterectomy in men are quite comparable. So the question is, is it reasonable to expect that carotid angioplasty results would improve over time? Well, yeah, it is. I mean, carotid endarterectomy results so it certainly improved over time. When we looked at that famous uh, or infamous publication of Easton and Sherman back in the 70s where carotid endarterectomy was carrying a 20% uh, death and stroke rate today, to today where we're down in the low single digits, it clearly did improve. Carotid angioplasty and standing is new technology and therefore it's reasonable to ex assume that it would improve over time. In fact, when the application was made to the FDA to approve carotid angioplasty and stenting for the average risk patient, remember up to that point, and in fact today, the only uh, reimbursable indication for carotid angioplasty and stenting is symptomatic high risk patients. But the application was made to the FDA to approve angioplasty and stenting for average risk patients, both symptomatic and asymptomatic. And the FDA pa uh, panel approved that application largely based upon the allegation that carotid and angioplasty and stenting improved over time. And that allegation was based upon a review of the um, registry data, but it was also inferred that it was demonstrated to be uh, true in Crest as well. Well, that was kind of news to us, so the Crest investigators decided to look at their own data over time to see, in fact, uh, we could co uh, confirm or deny. Now, there's no way that you're going to be able to read these data from the back of the room, but I put it up here just to show you how we designed this analysis. This represents carotid angioplasty and stenting. This represents carotid endarterectomy. And we looked at three time intervals during the course of the trial, uh, divided into so-called tertiles. And each tertile was, was designed to reflect an equivalent number of patients. So uh, this is the early part of the trial, the mid part of the trial, and the latter part of the trial. And if you look at unadjusted rates, it appears, in fact, that there is improvement um, with the results of carotid angioplasty and stenting. However, this is a very heterogeneous group of patients. And so what we did was to carry out a statistical adjustment uh, based upon age, gender, and symptomatic status. And when we did that, we found that the um, primary endpoint uh, during the first time interval was for angioplasty and stenting was 5.6%. For the second time interval, 5.6%, 
And for the third time interval, 5.4%, no difference. It did not improve over time when you looked at like patients. So the real question is, why didn't it improve? I mean, after all, this is new technology. The trial's been going on for now for 10 years. Uh, good people are doing it. Clearly, they ought to have gotten better over that period of time. Why didn't it improve? Well, I think if you look at the design of the trial, we might find some answers. First of all, in order to, for an interventionist to participate in the CREST trial, they had to undergo specific training uh, for, uh, in the use of the uh, devices that were approved for the trial, which was the AccuLink and AccuNet uh, filter. Uh, second of all, before they could begin to randomize patients, there was a lead-in phase, and they had to submit up to 20 cases during the lead-in phase. Those got reviewed by the Interventional Management Committee, and if uh, the individual submitting the data provided good data, then they were allowed to proceed with the randomized portion of the trial. So what did the CREST interventionist approval process uh, yield? 427 interventionists applied for approval. Only half of those, 227, actually uh, were uh, felt to be uh, of quality sufficient to meet this standard. And therefore, this very highly selected group of, of individuals, in my opinion, really was already up to speed. And therefore, it's not likely that their results are going to improve over time. And so I would uh, suggest to you that the current results using the transfemoral platform with distal protection device is really flawed. And I think that uh, in the CREST trial, which incidentally has got the best results of angioplasty and standing of any of the trials to date, but still not as good as carotid endarterectomy, that number is probably an irreducible irredu uh, minimum based upon the current platform of the transfemoral approach. So in summary, carotid angioplasty and stenting carries a higher stroke rate than carotid endarterectomy. Carotid angioplasty results have not improved with time, at least in the CREST trial. And it's unlikely that carotid angioplasty will, results will further improve with the current uh, platform that's being used. The caveat that I will uh, offer to you and that Chris is going to address is that carotid angioplasty and stenting may very well improve with new approaches such as a trans-cervical approach with flow reversal. Thanks very much for your attention.